In this video, we're going to discuss contact resistance, which is an additional thermal resistance that is encountered when conduction is occurring between two different materials which are in contact. We'll look at the effect of a contact resistance, and we'll look at how to analyze it with our resistance networks. When two materials are contacting, in order to understand contact resistance, we need to think about the microstructure of the contact. This is a scanning electron microscope image of a ceramic material. It's actually designed to be a porous ceramic material in a fuel cell, but it serves a good purpose for my example. If we look down at this fine scale at the micron level, the surface of that object is not smooth. There are lots of features there, different sizes of roughness, and if I put two such materials together, sometimes those high points are going to contact, and sometimes we're going to have one side of the material contacting a gap or a void in the other part of the material. This is a model that my student made of this material to understand uh, better how high temperature fuel cells work. I'm going to use it to demonstrate contact resistance. This is also another geometry of a contact. This actually represents another kind of porous material. It's fibrous paper type material. Uh, but basically we have uh, solid materials given by the solid materials given by the two shades of blue with a whole bunch of open material. Now if I think about two truly solid materials, two macroscopic solid parts with a conductivity Ks, and I want to put those two materials together, the microscopic features of those contacts, greatly exaggerated here, might look like this, they might look like the image on the other slide. But either way, there are points where we will have solid material contacts through there, and the other points in that contact that are going to reach this void space, which will be filled with perhaps the fill gas around the object, if this is happening in a room, these spaces will be filled with air, and air has a very, very low thermal conductivity. Now, if we put heat transfer through here, we put a high temperature T1 and low temperature T2, and we pass some heat flux Q, we're going to see nice one-dimensional heat transfer in the solid part on either side of this, where we have a nice a drop in temperature, linear drop in temperature proportional to that heat flux. And at the contact, we're going to get a very disturbed heat transfer where the conduction heat transfer is going to preferentially go through these solid parts that have a higher thermal conductivity and much less through, much less so through these void parts that have a lower thermal conductivity. So we'll get a redistribution where the thermal energy which is here is going to move through and find the path of least resistance through this material. As we exchange as we change the thermal contact of the material relative to the void. So what I've plotted here is three curves. Uh, the red curve where the material Ks is 78 times the conductivity of this void here. And this is the same as the material because this represents the physical contacts between these two different pieces of material. Uh, in the green case, the, the material is only 10 times more conductive than the void. And in the purple case, it's only two times more conductive than the void. And what we can see is the net effect of that redistribution through that contact is that as the difference between the void conductivity and the solid conductivity gets larger, we see a very sharp de decrease in temperature over that small contact. And that sharp decreases, decreases as the conductivity gets smaller, as the conductivity becomes more and more similar between those two materials. How do we add this to a resistance network? Of course, as per always, uh, we want to calculate a heat flux through a resistance network. We'll add our resistance for uh, the conduction through the solid part, the resistance for conduction through this solid part, and we're going to need something to represent this contact resistance. So we'll have three resistances in this simple system, and our conduction resistance, area-specific resistance in this case, because we're solving for the heat flux, is L, the dimension of this part, over the conductivity of the solid. Our resistance here is L over the conductivity of the solid. And we have this extra resistance in here. Now that's very difficult to characterize because it depends on the nature of that contact. And so what we typically do is we call that a thermal contact resistance. It's virtually always expressed in terms of an area-specific resistance. And when you have your own particular contact, uh, you can use the corresponding area of contact uh, in order to turn this into a heat flux if you wish to do that. And so this is something that we will look up. We'll just call that the area-specific uh, thermal contact resistance, and we'll add it to our resistor network exactly like this. We'll have to look that up now. This thermal contact resistance depends very much on the nature of this contact. And so when you look it up, 
you're going to have to look it up for the contacting materials that you have in question. If we have a smooth polished piece of copper in contact with another smooth polished piece of copper, you would look it up for value for that. If you had a piece of sandpaper contacting another one, that's going to result in a different, in a different thermal contact resistance. So you're going to have to look up the right thermal contact resistance or measure the thermal contact resistance for your particular system. And the thermal contact resistance is going to decrease with increasing contact area. What does that mean? If I take these two materials and I press them together harder and harder, I'm going to be causing more and more of those, of those roughness elements to contact. I'm going to be increasing that contact area. And so that thermal contact resistance is going to decrease with a higher contact pressure because it increases the contact area, makes less of a disturbance, and we see a smaller contact resistance. It also increases with increasing conductivity of the voids. We saw that in the previous, in the previous graphs. And so if we can fill this with a higher conductivity material, we will decrease the effect of the thermal contact resistance. This is a particularly important thing when we're thinking about a computer chip, and it's why we use a thermal paste. If this is my computer chip, and it's rejecting a significant amount of heat in order to run the computer, we're going to put a heat sink over there. I'll just represent my heat sink by a solid box, and I'll have some convection and T infinity through here. And so we'll have some temperature drop through the heat sink. And if we have a large contact resistance, I'll exaggerate it and go out from here, but if we have a large contact resistance here, we're going to have a large jump in temperature, and the processor, the computer processor, is going to see this much higher temperature. If we could have a smaller contact resistance, of course the processor would see a smaller temperature down here. And so what we do before we put the heat sink onto the processor is we add a thermal paste, which is filling these voids, raising this conductivity, and making sure that we don't expose our processor to excessive temperatures. If we have a bad thermal contact, we will over uh, in, exceed the maximum operating temperature of our processor, and that is why we're trying to avoid. The contact resistance is far more significant when high conductivity materials contact. So if you can imagine that I'm taking two pieces of copper here with a conductivity of approximately 400 watts per meter Kelvin, and I'm putting these two pieces of copper together, I'm going to see a significant change because that fill gas, a significant temperature drop between them because the fill gas on that micro roughness is going to be the conductivity of air, which is many orders of magnitude smaller than the conductivity of copper. If these two pieces instead were insulation, and I was putting two pieces of insulation together, I wouldn't be concerned at all about the contact resistance because the conductivity of this void would be similar to the insulation, and I'd have something that's closer to the purple line. So again, to minimize the contact resistance in my copper, I'd want to polish that surface as much as possible to make sure the roughness was as little as possible, and I'd want to contact them with a significant pressure to make as large a contact area as possible. Also, I might want to introduce another fill gas if possible. I might want to do it in a different than air environment if it was important. Or I might want to introduce a thermal paste in order to reduce that. Either way, you can add these to your resistance networks by coming up with a suitable value for the thermal contact resistance and simply adding it into your network as another resistor.